Welcome back folks, so here we are again in my in my office, you can see I've had a bit of a haircut, so my head probably get cold, I have to put a hat on in a little bit probably. Um, let's move on to our next module here, and the next thing we're going to talk about is membrane structure, transport of um, solutes and other materials across the membrane, and then at the end we'll look a little bit at cell junctions. We've got a lot to get through, so let's get started. So the first thing about cell membranes is um, that they are selectively permeable and that's kind of the most important thing that you have to take from this if there's any take-home message you have to take away that membranes are selectively permeable so our goal here is to look at the structure of the membrane and relate it to the function and the function is one of selective permeability so what does that actually mean something that's selectively permeable will allow some things to pass through it but not others and so this is important because it establishes the inside world of the cell from the outside world of the cell so on the slide here is what, is what we're looking at um, are different permeabilities to different types of molecule or, or ions or different substances so at the top there anything that's hydrophobic that's going to pass through really through a membrane, a plasma membrane, a cell membrane, any of the internal membranes, the rough ER membrane, the nuclear envelope like we talked about before. So anything that is sufficiently small and hydrophobic, like oxygen, carbon dioxide, and nitrogen, will pass very, very easily through the membrane, as long as there's a gradient. And we'll talk about gradients a little later. Then if we take molecules which are very small, uncharged, but polar, things like water, up to the size of kind of glycerol. Polar molecules, but they're sufficiently small that they will diffuse across the membrane, but only very, very slowly. Now let's go to large uncharged polar molecules. Sugars, for example, simple carbohydrates like glucose and sucrose. They have a much, much lower probability of crossing the membrane. And then if we go up to ions, which are very, very small, smaller than, than, than sugars and things like that, uh, chlorine, potassium, sodium, you see there, they're unified by having a charge, a complete charge. So what are the characteristics of these things which affect whether they can move or they can't move? Well, it comes down to two things, or three things really, size, charge, and polarity. So if we think about oxygen, oxygen, the gas, um, two oxygen atoms, double bond between them and both atoms pulling equally on, on the electrons in the covalent bond. We're back to our basic chemistry here with the electronegativity thing. And so the double bond in oxygen is nonpolar, which makes oxygen a nonpolar molecule. So that means it's going to dissolve in the, in the middle of the membrane. And we'll look at the structure of the membrane and explain that a little bit more. Same for CO2, same for nitrogen. Um, the charged, uh, sorry, the, the uncharged small polar molecules like water, they're small enough, even though they're polar. But as we start to get bigger, is what happens is that we start to get these hydration shells around the molecules. Chlorine ions, potassium, calcium, get these big hydration shells. Same thing with glucose and sucrose, they're covered with water. And that increases their, their polarity, or in the case of ions, their net charge, far too much to move freely. So I want to be clear here, we're talking about the probabilities of something moving. Now, if we had enough glucose outside the membrane and very, very little inside, so a high concentration of glucose outside and a low concentration inside, and if we waited long enough, I can guarantee some of the molecules of glucose would pass. But the probability is very, very low. When we get up to ions, it's diminishingly small. But the probability of a small hydrophobic molecule like oxygen moving across the membrane is very, very high. So the higher the probability of moving and the bigger the difference in the concentrations outside versus inside the membrane work together to give you a relative permeability. And so big concentration on one side in terms of oxygen, small concentration on the other side. And that means you're going to get a very rapid movement of oxygen, carbon dioxide, and nitrogen. Now think about that. That's important because right now you're sitting breathing and you're exchanging gases across the membranes of the cells that line your lungs, particularly the alveoli, the little sacs of membrane uh, that are down at the bottom of the bronchioles in your lungs. And so you want oxygen, carbon dioxide to be freely moving backwards and forwards. 
But on the other hand, you don't want molecules like glucose and sucrose to be leaking out of cells when those molecules need to be in the cells to be broken down to produce things like ATP so that you can do all the things your cells need to do. So it's all about probability and it's all about the characteristics. And so the question often comes up, how do I know whether something is hydrophobic or polar or charged? Well, charge is easy because it's got a great big plus or minus stuck on it. We've talked about polarity. And so this goes back to that complicated discussion we had about electronegativities. So looking at the electronegativities of atoms, you should be able to work out whether, whether a molecule is polar, nonpolar, and therefore hydrophobic or hydrophilic. So you should be able to work a lot of these out. So let's start now taking a look at the structure of membranes and try and work out why we have those relative permeabilities. Well, membranes are made primarily of phospholipids, which I've introduced before a little bit. And so let's just recap the structure of the phospholipid. Two fatty acid tails, lots of carbon, lots of hydrogen. These two things, these fatty acyl chains, they are predominantly, in fact, I'm sorry, they're exclusively hydrophobic. They're fatty. Then we've got a, a, a kind of glycerol backbone, and then we've got a phosphate group, and then usually some kind of charged or very, very polar group. So remember, the top of the molecule here is either charged or polar, and the fatty acid tails are nonpolar. So we get this situation where this molecule is amphipathic. So hopefully, if you're thinking back to what amphipathic means in the context of phospholipids, you can give a go, uh, you can have a go at this question to so see how you do, and then we'll start up again in a moment. Okay, so if you take phospholipids and you dump them into a beaker of water, that's an aqueous solution, they will arrange into structures called leaflets and you can make them do some other stuff as well but we're interested in these leaflets and so you get this kind of double leaflet or this bilayer structure where we get these two layers of phospholipids and is what happens is the polar head groups which are these kind of aquamarine um, ovals they face the water and so, for example, they would face the outside of the cell or the inside of the cell. And then the fatty tails stick together. Oily things like to stick together. So you have this wonderfully simple self-assembling structure called the lipid bilayer. And so when you look at this structure, the majority, three quarters, I would say three quarters of the thickness of a membrane is hydrophobic. And so that hydrophobic core is going to stop charged large enough polar molecules from crossing back and forth freely. If something is small and hydrophobic, uh, non-polar, like carbon dioxide, it's going to be able to effectively dissolve in this hydrophobic core, which means it can move from one side of the membrane to another. Okay, so this is going all the way back to that chemistry. So if you're struggling with that chemistry, you've got to go back because now we're applying it to a biological context. Okay, so what else have we got in membranes? They're not just phospholipids, but it's largely phospholipids. Two other molecules that you really have to be interested in, proteins and cholesterol. So um, proteins are embedded in the membrane and attached to the membrane in some different ways, which we'll look at in a moment. And so we can see, if we look at this kind of artistic representation of a membrane. We can see the two phospholipid bilayers and they've been peeled back a little bit so you can see inside. This kind of cream colored inside, a little bit orangey, that's the hydrophobic core. And obviously the membranes don't peel apart like that. That's just the, the artist showing us that they, there are two bilayers. We've got all of these membrane proteins that span the membrane. And now we talked a little bit um, uh, a little while ago about, about how you can traffic proteins from the cytoplasm into the, into the membranes of the rough ER and then through the Golgi and then to the cell membrane. So that's how these structures get here. And some of these membrane proteins are going to have um, glycolipids, um, sugars and, and lipids attached to them. So is what we have is a structure called the fluid mosaic membrane. Uh, we'll come to the fluidity part in a moment. The mosaic part is because you have this kind of sea of phospholipids and then embedded in the phospholipids like a mosaic you have these, these proteins. 
What about cholesterol? Um, cholesterol is a bit of an odd creature. We're going to talk about it in more detail in a moment. Here's a molecule of cholesterol if we look at a bilayer. So cholesterol inserts between the fatty acid tails. Go back and take a look at cholesterol and take a look at its, uh, at its chemical characteristics and you'll see that it does a very good job of inserting into this non-polar core of the membrane which is shown in white hair. Okay, so let's talk about these proteins in the membrane in a little bit more detail. There are three ways in which you can associate a protein with a lipid bilayer. Three ways. Uh, the first way is you can make the protein completely span the phospholipid bilayer. So here's a protein, dark blue in the middle of the slide here, and part of the protein is on the outside of the membrane, a part of the membrane, a part of the protein spans the membrane, and then there's a part inside. And often this part of the membrane or part of the protein that spans the membrane is made up exclusively of alpha helix. There are exceptions to this. Uh, there are some proteins which actually have beta sheet to make up this transmembrane region, but here it's probably going to be alpha helix. And we talked about alpha helices and beta sheets when we looked at protein structure. So here again is that material being used a little bit later. A second way you can associate proteins with the membrane is by attaching another protein to a transmembrane protein, and that's called a peripheral membrane protein. And these were only attached to the inside of the cell. So this is the cytosol down here. This is outside the cell, the so-called extracellular environment. And there's a little protein down here in light blue that's attached to this larger transmembrane protein. So that's another general way in which you can associate a, a protein with the membrane. Now the last way, a little bit more complicated. Here is a protein and that protein has had a short lipid attached to it. Now we've, we've talked a little bit about adding sugars to proteins when we talked about the Golgi and the, and the ER, but you can also add lipids to proteins as well. And a variety of lipids you can add to proteins. And the function of this little lipid here is to insert into the membrane and anchor this little protein in like light purple to the inside leaflet of the membrane. Again, only found on the inside leaflet, not on the outside of the cell. So what is the relationship between the structure and the function of this lipid? Well, the lipid, the short lipid there, it's hydrophobic. And so it can do its job of anchoring this protein into the membrane because this hydrophobic lipid tail can kind of force its way into the hydrophobic core of the membrane. Okay, so there are some, some different types of ways that you can associate proteins with membranes. Um, let's just think really quickly, how would a glycosylated membrane protein arrive at the cell membrane? Let's say we're talking about a transmembrane protein that's been glycosylated. Give this one a go. Okay, so that is our introduction to structure and function. Remember, the key here is being able to explain selective permeability. We're going to come to some other features of selective permeability, but so far I've explained one aspect of selective permeability, and that is that if you are charged or too large and polar, you cannot cross the hydrophobic core of the membrane. That means that you have to have a different way to get into or out of the cell, but if you are small and polar or hydrophobic and small, you can freely diffuse back and forth across the membrane. And that's all about the hydrophobic core of the membrane. So we'll wrap it up there and I'll be back soon with some more on membrane structure, membrane transport and cell junctions.